You're listening to the Rogue Ones Podcast. I'm your rogue leader, Leslie Eiler Thompson, and before the theme music plays, can I just say thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to this. And I hope you enjoy today's truly amazingly wonderful, outstanding, phenomenal episode. And if you do enjoy it, would you tell a friend? Well, one, two, three, here it comes. One of the most wonderful things about having this podcast is that in the process of discovering the Rogue One and the experiences that have made their lives extraordinary is that you get to come along with me. And today, we get to go someplace pretty cool. We get to talk with someone paving a rogue path with gratitude and awareness that her success is not entirely of her own doing. This is a conversation about recognizing those who have given us big breaks and who have stepped down to offer us a hand as we're crawling our way up the stairs. Chances are, you've seen this guest. Actor and producer Monica Padman has not only been on multiple national commercials, here's just a sampling. She's one of the mermaids in the Herbal Essences commercial and is part of the team that comes up with the new set of voices after Alexa loses her voice in Amazon's 2018 Super Bowl commercial. And fun side note, my Amazon Alexa definitely just went off. Monica is also a producer and co-host for a little old podcast called Armchair Expert by Dax Shepard and creative partner to Kristen Bell. We talk dreams, broken dreams, the importance of seeking truth, and the value of being exactly who you are. I am entirely pleased to introduce to you Monica Patman. Please enjoy. Monica Padman, thank you for joining us on the Rogue Ones podcast. Absolutely. So good thank to have you. Me. You are an actor, a producer, and the co host of Dax Shepard's wildly popular podcast, Armchair Expert, Kristen Bell's creative partner, and a fellow Southerner. That's right, I am. Born in Atlanta? Yeah, suburbs of Atlanta. Which and suburb? Duluth. Well, I was oh. born in Norcross, and then I grew up in Duluth. Would you believe you know it? I've been to Duluth. No way. <laughs> yes way. Uh, For what? Well, my husband's uncle, he owns a media company that only covers pulp, the pulp and paper industry. Oh, wow. Talk about a niche, right? That is so specific. <laughs> yes, and he, they live in Duluth. And so he brought me down, me and my husband, we came down, and we went to a Braves game. Mm. And They're I got very to see fun. The oh, it was so fun. Isn't it fun? I know. I'm so not into sports, but I enjoy those games yeah. so much. Okay, so Duluth, suburb of Atlanta. And then you did you go to the public school system in your area or did you I did. I went to the I, I graduated from Duluth High School in 2005. Um, and I, then I went to the University of Georgia after that. Is that the one in Athens? It is. Would you believe I've also been there? <laughs> I, be I believe that more than Duluth, but, yeah. um, yeah, it was the best. I mean, it, it was the most quintessential college experience I could really? have ever imagined. What do you mean by that? Like, what is quintessential college experience? Like, Every book you read about college life, every movie you see, uh -huh. it is that to a T. It's just depicted so perfectly, and it's beautiful. Like, the campus uh -huh. is beautiful, and I kind of came from, with a group of friends from high school, we all went to UGA because at that time, and it still exists, but Georgia has a HOPE scholarship program. So if you graduate from high school there with, I think it's changed now, but I think back then it was a three, five or above. Mm -hmm. You qualified for the Hope Scholarship, which was free tuition to a Georgia Completely state Completely free? Yes, which is incredible. And I had these like big, big dreams of grad, of, of going to UCLA. That was my oh. like big dream. So it was like once this Hope Scholarship started happening, I was like, ah, well, I, cause my parents were like, no, like you are going to get a free education here. Yeah. I and don't blame them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, if you want to go somewhere else, you can, but you're going to have to get loans and you're going to have to do the thing. 
And I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll compromise. I'll go to Georgia for two years and then I'll transfer for the, the last two years to UCLA. That, that was what was going on in my head. And you wanted to do UCLA because cause at UGA you were in theater, right? I was Is that what theater. you wanted to do always? Yep, yep. I, I, I knew I wanted to be an actress when I was, I mean, I think when I was pretty young, but really in ninth grade I started theater at my high school and I, it was like, it was just the end. I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I, I know it. Um, so I really wanted to study theater and I knew it was like, I guess I should go to LA or New York Mm -hmm. to do that. And I also knew that I would never be able to be someone who went to like a conservatory program and like Mm. really, really study it. Like my parents, would not have been down for that. (laughs) And to be honest, I would not have either. Like I wanted to go to a, like accredited university. Right. And I would imagine the, the call, the quintessential college experience you've talked about at UGA does not exist at a conservatory. No, 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 no. You really enjoyed that and you kind of wanted that. But I didn't know I was looking for that. I guess mm. is what I'm saying. I didn't know. Like yeah. I was like, oh, I'm gonna go study theater, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna graduate with all these skills, and I'm gonna be a working actor. And I, I had all these thoughts about what college was gonna give me for my acting and for my career. But I had no idea that like I was just gonna get this perfect, perfect experience that you just can't mm. get in any other capacity. So I, I feel right. so grateful that I sort of stumbled into that and then stayed, and it was really really it was formative and so you said you also double majored in PR where was that (laughs) decision so coming from someone who is has a degree in music my question to you is was PR like a backup like okay mom and dad I'll do this also but it's even a double major so like that's a lot of work I know. Um, yes, absolutely. 100%. It was a, it was me placating my parents. They didn't ask me to, but I was like, I knew when I told them that I was going to study theater, like any parent, I think they, um, are, were worried about their kid and wanted me to have the most opportunity, the most stable options available to me. Mm -hmm. And, I completely understand that. Like if I don't have children, but I think about if I had a kid, would I want them to do this? Sometimes I talk about it with Dax and Kristen, obviously, because their kids are, I'm very, very, very close with their kids. Yeah. And they're growing up, obviously, with everyone around them is doing something creative, not even like their mom and their dad, but also me and Dax's sister, like all, everyone. Oh, yeah. is everyone, doing that's what they're watching as they're yeah. going through their formative years. Yeah. Exactly. That Those are the models that they have. And I always think like what I want them to do and to do this or what I want my yeah. kids. And, and ultimately, Ultimately, I think you just have to be like, well, they're going to do what they want regardless. So you almost shouldn't even spend too much time thinking about it. Right, right. But I fully understand where my parents were coming from. But they were not, they were not thrilled by the idea of me studying theater. And did you, were you even able to verbalize at that time what you were going to do with it other than be a working actor? Like, did you want to go stage or film or TV? Like, did you know what you wanted to do with I did know to some extent, or I thought I knew, I I definitely wanted to do TV and film, um, mainly TV. And that's pretty much because in eighth grade, I fell in love with two things like head over heels, full obsession, friends and goodwill hunting. Ugh. And- I mean, golden, I, I golden it, years of yes of pop culture media. Absolutely, I was so obsessed with those things. I mean, the, my friend's obsession like borders on something pathological. I mean, it was like <laughs> really, really crazy. I had like a whole oh, this is so embarrassing to say. This was before the DVDs. <laughs> okay, so I had to VHS tape. I VHS taped every single episode oh of my Friends. God. And I had like a color coded system for how I labeled the episodes on the tapes. And it was, I mean, it was a real something 
oh to my. like witness. Yeah. And I think I had 32 tapes at the That's end of it all. I was going to ask is how long, how many tapes are we talking at the end of I, all of it? Wow. I think it 32. Was 32. Yeah, and were they but, cataloged? Like, did you catalog them? Y- yes, exactly. So I had, like, I had this whole system, and it was color-coded by season, and, like, the way I wrote the names of the episode, like, matched the color that I had designated for that season. I mean, it oh, was, like, yeah. it, it, it was so oh, type yeah. A and strange. Um <laughs> And fully encapsulates my personality. Like, if I start liking something, it is the end. I mean, it is all Mm. or nothing, always. Mm. So, anyway, I was obsessed with Friends and Good Will Hunting. Good Will Hunting in a similar sense. And I was like, I have to do that. I have to be a part of something that is making me feel like this. I want to make other people feel like this. They look like they're having the most fun anyone could ever possibly have. They're also being emotional. Like, all of the things. I was like, I just have to. And then I started theater, and then it was all confirmed. Um, And it's kind of funny because, you know, I always used to say, like, all I want to do is, like, be on a Friends and be on Hmm. an ensemble TV show. And the truth is, like, that's still my goal. Like, that's still true. A ensemble, like, Friends where there's not, like, a legit lead and supporting. It's like everyone's kind of working together and that's still my goal. It seems like a very collaborative um, atmosphere. Yes. And it seems like you really have to be, there is no one shining person necessarily, so all of you have to be at the top of your game and support each other. Support each other is the big thing. It's so fun to do that. I've gotten to do that a lot later once I got to LA because I got very into improv and that's the exact same yeah. thing. So yeah. So let's talk about that. So you moved to LA, which it sounds like what you wanted to do for all time always. Did you move yeah. right after college? I lived at home for a year after college. I worked at my high school cheerleading coach's gym <laughs> and awesome. I had an agent there and I worked a little bit in Atlanta uh, as an actor and then for a year and then I moved to LA after that. Okay. And so you moved to LA. Did you get involved with Upright Citizens right away or was there a period of time where you It was it was pretty quick. I knew about it going in. Mm-hmm. Like before I moved there, I knew about the Upright Citizens Brigade and I I'm also like a full um I it's like full immersion as soon as I start getting turned on to someone, I like go down the rabbit hole and watch all the videos. And so I think I sort of feel like there's never enough information about a topic Mm. or a person. Mm -hmm. So I'm always It's funny you say that because, um, so Upright Citizens Brigade for people who might be listening that don't know, um, improv started in Chicago with, uh, Amy Poehler and I, improv terrifies me because I've only been to those games where it's like tap person on the shoulder when yes. you want to like whatever. And then I saw Ask Cat. Uh, mm. There's some, I haven't seen it live, but there is some video on YouTube of like all those people doing it. And I did the same thing you did, rabbit hole. And there aren't many videos of it, of that yeah. practice. And I am dying to see it. But that long form. Oh my form. gosh. Long form improv. Yep, that's what I was just about to say. The the games and what a, a lot of um, regional theater improv groups focus on is short form improv, which is games like that. Mm-hmm. They're, they're called short form games. And the Upright Citizens Brigade and many other improv um, places here and in New York focus on long form, which is like you basically you're given a word and then you improvise for Hmm. however long off of that one word and it goes places. And it's the most, um, I mean, it is the most electric feeling Uh. when it, when it works, it is the most electric feeling in the world. (laughs) Like there's no comparing. So then that's also to say when it doesn't work. Oh boy, it's the worst. (laughs) I mean, mean, it it, it couldn't be worse. I had an improv teacher say, watching improv is like watching someone on a ladder and the ladder is tipping over and you can't help (sighs) Like you're all, and it's so true because at any moment they could just fall and crash there and break their head open and be, and it, it's, it can be excruciating, but 
it can also be the most joyous mm-hmm. thing. I I would really encourage if anyone's ever in LA or New York, Chicago, a lot of places to go see a long form improv show. Your mind will be blown. It's incredible. It, it's incredible. And I, th- I think the practicality of long form versus short form is as you watch these shows that do allow um, for some time, sometimes of improv it, when they're filming and then it makes it to the final cut or whatever, how all, mm-hmm. how all of that works. But that the skills you learn in a long form process of understanding story, um, where are we going? What's the end goal? Yes, what has the- just happened and what's going on around me? Like all mm-hmm. of those things. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 much more full immersion and awareness, whereas short form is like you're really focused on one thing and you hit it and you're done. Right. And and which is which is also by the way, I don't don't mean to belittle it. It's incredibly hard to be good at that as well. It's it's another full skill and can all right. it can lead to like the mo- the biggest laughs. But oh, um, and I think that's the most interesting thing to me is there's a the guy who studied improv, I worked with him for a second and we started talking about this and he, he brought up the concept of dirty jokes, for example, within mm-hmm. long form improv, they're known as cheap and you don't really want to go for the easy, dirty joke. Absolutely. And you know, it's not all about the big, massive laugh. It's the, it's the long payoff. It is payoff and callback. And it, it's so much more satisfying when you hit a joke or call something back and people recognize it. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's That's special. incredible. Yeah. yeah. So you're in Upright Citizens Brigade in New York and or, in sorry, LA, in LA. Yeah. And then what, what was that like to, to uproot from a very Southern mm. area? And I mean, Atlanta is pretty, um, diverse and about diverse as you can get in the South, but then, yeah. Then you moved to Los Angeles, and how long, I mean, I know it's a constant struggle when you're in a creative industry like that, but how long was it before you got your first gig, and what was that whole culture shock like? Well, it was it was pretty seamless. So Duluth is, I always say, a suburb that could have been in anywhere USA. Like, okay. it was not super, you know, it wasn't in, like, rural Georgia or anything like that. Yeah. It was a very, like very stereotypical suburban life. However, you know, it's the South. It's, it's Mm -hmm. pretty conservative and religious, like, you know, all of these things that I am not. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, I also, it's not like I'm not now that I'm in LA. I was never like my family has always been a little more liberal and not Mm -hmm. religious and none of those things. So I always felt like an out, a little bit like an outsider hmm. there. Yeah. But when I came here, I was like, oh, these, <laughs> this is the place, huh. where, this is the place that I'm supposed to probably live. Most people are more in line with my values here. Like, I, you know, I, I fit in yeah. here. I fit in here way more than I fit in there ideologically. Well, and it's also so funny because I, you know, I have a lot of, I, I've had a lot of issues in life about being different and about growing up Indian in a Southern state. And that's a whole lot of, that's a whole lot of, uh, cultures right there. Indian and Southern state. Oh, a lot of culture, a lot of long held, you know, decade after decade of culture built up. That's kind of colliding, you know? It is. And it's so interesting because I, you know, my mom was born in India, but then she grew up in Savannah, Georgia. She, when she was like six. So she grew up there and then my dad came in, um, his twenties. But so I was very, very, very Americanized. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. there was not a lot of like Indian culture stuff happening in my house. Probably. I think my parents feel like a little bit now I think they feel a little bit sad about that. Like they oh, didn't really? give us, they didn't give us enough exposure to any of those things. Huh. But at that time I was like, thank God I do not 
<sighs> want to be associated. That's the last thing I want to be associated with. That's I don't so want to be different. F- it's your, every kid's nightmare. Every kid. Now forget yeah. what your ethnicity is. Any any person in high school just wants to fit in. That is yes. the goal. That yes. is the sole goal is to fit in, is to be popular. But being popular is a is an effect of fitting in. You know, the idea so of backwards. It our, is our poor little brains in high school. I know. It's so sad. <laughs> and also it's so funny because then you start you realize as soon as you as soon as your brain fully forms and you become an adult, you realize like, oh wait, no, those are the things that make me interesting. But right. at that time, like all I was doing, I spent so much of that time just like trying to erase anything that even remotely made me different. And, you know, back when there, when people would ask me, and it would happen often, obviously, like, where are you from? They were asking, (laughs) what's your ethnicity? Right. You know, but they were saying, where are you from? What's your ethnicity? And when I moved here, people would ask, where are you from? And they literally meant, (sighs) like, the answer was Georgia. That's what they were were looking for. That's what they were asking. Yeah. Right. Right. And I was so pleased by that. Like, oh, they're not asking me what my ethnicity is. They're literally asking me where I'm from. And I just, I just appreciated that so much coming here. So when I first got out here, I didn't know what to do. I was like, how do I do this? Did you know anybody? Yes. So I moved in with my best friend, Anthony, we moved out together. He just moved out oh, okay. a month before me. Um, but he, uh, we moved out together. He wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be an actor and we sort of joined forces. We moved, we just got a random apartment that we found like on West Side Rentals or something from <laughs> Atlanta. Like we hadn't seen it. We didn't know. We were taking a big leap. That's the best way to do it. It's the only way. I mean, truthfully, <laughs> it's yeah. the only way. It's, it's you have to. It, it requires so much faith in yourself and faith in the world that like mm. everything's just gonna work out for you. Right. And that was kind of always our philosophy. He got a job uh, working as a PA, a production assistant on Modern Family. Okay. And I was like, I don't have a job. I don't have anything. (laughs) What am I going to do? So I started, I like applied to all these babysitting jobs and I got a bunch of babysitting jobs. And then I was every day, I was just sending out my resume and my headshot like via email. Mm. I would just go on IMDb Pro and look up anyone who I liked and then find out their agent and then email. And it was just like, it was a, Mm. it was incessant thing commercially and uh, theatrically. And, you know, of course, nobody is responding. Maybe one person is responding saying like, no, yeah. basically. <laughs> and right. I was like, okay, great, great. And then I, e- and one day one person emailed me back and it was the assistant to the person I had emailed. Okay. And she emailed me back and said, hey, you know, I'm interested. Send me some of your materials. And I'm like, materials? Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What do I do? I don't have any. I sent you my materials. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. um, But I had done a little work in Atlanta. I had done an episode of Drop Dead Diva. I had done, like, a couple commercials. I had done a little bit there. And I had done a lot of, like, short film work in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I basically sent her, like, a a reel that I had compiled and she responded and said, this is great. You're a little green. Um, so, you know, keep going. Basically she said, keep going and keep me updated. What a great email response. Yes. Yes. It was, it was the best because she wasn't telling me no. Right. But she was telling me She wasn't telling me no, she wasn't telling me yes, but she was telling me maybe. Like, that's like kind of how I took it. It's like, oh. Well, it sounds like she was telling you to stay in the game. Stay in the game. Yeah. She wasn't telling you to stop. She was saying, well, yeah, keep going, you know? Yes, she was, she was encouraging me to keep going. And the idea that I was like, oh, well, there's somebody that I could, if I have updates, I, I have a person I can send them to. Yeah. It was like enough. It was enough to just get me, it got me into 
an improv class, which I was very, I knew about it going in and I knew that I had to do it. Like I knew, cause I always wanted to do comedy. So, and that was always what I um, definitely excelled at in high school. I knew that was my thing, but I knew to do it. I had to like join Groundlings or Upright Citizen Brigade or something. So I was just stalling. But as soon as Brooke, Brooke Popjoy, who sent that email, Mm-hmm. She, um, when she said that, I was like, okay, signing up for class tomorrow, doing mm-hmm. this, doing this, doing this. Mm-hmm. And I did. I just kept her updated for probably a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two. I don't even, to be honest, I don't remember the timeline, probably about a year. Mm-hmm. And the next year, she sent me an audition for a pilot. Wow. So that's a and- year of. Like a training, just, yeah, right. Training, doing um, web series with friends, doing all, making a ton of my own stuff, writing my own stuff, really just delving into the training. And I'm so glad. I'm so yeah. glad I had that time to really kind of focus on getting good, you know, right. as opposed to just like getting somewhere. She um, sent me in on this pilot. It was for this show called Girlfriend in a Coma. It was like five Mm -hmm. lines as like a nurse or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I went and I booked it. Hooray. Yes, which is rare. You don't normally book the first, as I now know, you you don't normally, the chances are not very high. So I booked that, which was great because, um, for me, I was like, oh my God, this is so great because now she is going to have some confidence in me. Like that's really all I cared about. And I went, we did the table read for this pilot. I mean, this is all so new to me. I'm, uh, you know, I'm so, so excited. And then we end up after the table read, the lead of that show got fired, which happens all the time. I also okay. now know <laughs> she is a name actress and I was at the table read. I thought everything was great. She got fired the next day and based on the table read or was, were there other things like were there I, other issues? I assume it was based on the table read that it wow. happens a lot. We're just because because in that table read, there are so many people there the network is there, all the production people are like, everyone is there and everyone is deciding even though they've already decided. It's a strange, it's a very like, it's just so anxiety provoking sitting there Mm -hmm. and knowing you're sort of like on, me might get like cut at any moment, but anyway, they could never find a replacement and we never shot it. Oh my word. So I booked this thing, but I, I, I didn't shoot it. It was like a very strange, it was all very strange, but ultimately it was good for my relationship with Brooke. And then we just worked together, uh, kind of sporadically. Like she didn't like sign me or anything, but she would just send me things. She would send me things when she thought that she thought would work for me. She sent me auditions and I'm so incredibly thankful for her and the fact that she as an oh which I should say now she's a full blown humongous really manager yes ah, good so for her. when I absolutely and it was just you know she was an assistant and she was like hmm I'm gonna which is why she's so amazing and why she's so successful is because she's like taking chances on people and responding to people like she's doing her due diligence I just am grateful for her and you need those people like you need people right. to take chances on you I think I think most everybody um could probably tell stories of who was that first person that yeah. took a chance on you and even if it was a small thing if it was something that set off a chain reaction to a large thing it's yes. so important and to respect those people and to learn from them you yeah know? and to pay it forward I think yeah, that's also absolutely absolutely right so you did you had that unfortunate experience which is awesome because you booked something but then whoops <laughs> but then it was nothing yeah yeah so what was your next thing and how long until that happened I think the next thing I booked I also had a commercial agent at that time but I wasn't really going out much at all commercially and I wasn't booking anything but it was like really rare I think I was dropped by that first commercial agent and which was at that point like felt I was like oh well I should just quit I mean I, I mean it felt so devastating right right I can get that yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it's someone basically telling you, like, you're not good enough. Exactly. Well, this, is, this is what you hear, anyway. I don't know well, if it's, it's and the Well, and going back to the idea of how Brooke basically said with that first email, okay, you're green, but it was kind of like a green light to keep going. And I think for people who are creative, we're constantly waiting for someone to tell us, you can stop now, like, you know what, yes. good run, or actually, no, keep going. And I think we actually start to find that, those things don't exist, but we read situations as being those voices. Absolutely. It's it's everyone's validating whatever you already think about yourself. So yeah. if you're insecure about, and of course you are, everyone is when they right. start. And and always, actually, it's, which is so funny. What I'm really learning now is like, oh, that never goes away, yeah. ever. And the bar just keeps moving higher and higher and higher. Once you get one wrong, it's the next, it's the next, it's the next. But the insecurity mm-hmm. and the feelings of inadequacy and all of these things, they're real forever until you fix them internally. Mm-hmm. I think it's great for everyone to recognize that. Like, oh, it doesn't matter what I get. Like, it's not mm-hmm. going to fix this thing, mm-hmm. which is insecurity or low self-esteem or whatever you're feeling um, th- th- those things are not going to f- fix it. Right. But like your internal work will, and right. regardless of whether you have any of the success. So it's a mind game. And especially when you get dropped from, <laughs> you know, you're new, yeah. you're new to the whole geographical area and you get dropped from an agent, a commercial, you know, situation. That's hard. That's hard yeah, on a young soul. It is. And at that time, I felt like, oh my God, but I need her. I need Mm. her. Without her, I can't even get into these rooms. I can't Mm -hmm. even try to get better. I need her. What do I do? And that's really when I started like, doing a, making a lot of my own stuff. Cause I was like, what do I do? Like, I need all these people and they won't help me. I guess I'll Mm. just have to do a bunch of stuff on my own with my friends. It was just so nice to feel like, I don't need anyone to be yeah. fulfilled, to, right. to feel creative. Like no one can stop me from feeling creative. And so, but then once you start doing your own things, opportunities come. Like they right. do start showing themselves to you. So I got a new commercial agent through Brooke. She helped set that up. And I guess after um, Girlfriend in a Coma, I did an episode of House of lies. Okay. I think that must have been the next thing I did. And I played Kristen Bell's assistant on that. Was that like when you were in the scenes, did it feel so natural that it (laughs) just like, I mean, it's just so funny that that ended up being a thing that you did in real life. It was such a life art moment. I mean, it was, it's, I laugh at it so much. And I always, well, I guess I'll go back. I knew Kristen, uh, through mutual friends, but just at like parties, it was like, hi, you know, it was just mm-hmm. like, I knew of her because we had some mutual friends, but we, mm-hmm. we definitely weren't like ever having like deep in conversation or anything. She like maybe knew my name. She'll probably tell you that she did know it, but I don't know that she really did. <laughs> uh, so I arrive on set and she does recognize me and she's like, oh, hi. And, and so we start talking. She had just had her first kid Lincoln mm-hmm. and you know, we're chatting all day and I basically tell her like, oh, also I babysit. If you ever need a babysitter, let me know. And she was like, great, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I just started sporadically babysitting for them over time. And then that turned into a permanent, like, you know, nine to five nanny Mm -hmm. position with them. And so so I started doing that. And then that then morphed because the kids went to school. Oh, they went, okay. started going to preschool, yeah. so then that morphed into me being her professional assistant. You know, I started kind of running her life, and then and I and then I yeah. started writing a bunch of stuff for her. And mm. now I'm now we are creative partners, and I write stuff for her all the time, and we produce some stuff together, and we just. Um, yeah, we're we're far more partners now, and it's just it's just morphed. It's just like yeah. slowly, slowly morphed. I think I am not a person for better or for worse that is like content. Right. It was never going right. to stay with me just being a babysitter there because right. I, I I just 
I wouldn't have been able to, you know? And it speaks a great deal to the character of of Kristen. Oh, man. And when I started there, I had no delusions of grandeur. I had nothing that was like, oh, well, maybe eventually I'll get to do this and do this. It wasn't like that. It was like, oh, I guess I'll do this for now for however long I I can and then I'll have to get something else. It was like, because I can't be a babysitter forever, but also this is great for now and these people are lovely and wonderful and special. And so that was the thought. And then I, I just inserted myself a lot. Exactly like you said. It really speaks to her character and I have I mean I could talk for 15 hours Hmm. about the the, just the unbelievable character of Kristen Bell but truthfully she's just open she's just open Mm. to people she was very open to me inserting my opinion and then turns out we just are very very similar and Mm -hmm. we I can speak in her voice very easily. And so we, we just sort of have this like transferable personality between the two of us. Absolutely. It just so happened that way. I, that was just luck. And, um, and then, yeah, so I started inserting myself and then she started, and then I started like doing a little bit of writing as this, like as her assistant, like a magazine, questionnaire, 10 things oh, you don't know about Kristen. So you were and I'd the be person like, that were doing those things. Sometimes I'd be like, do you want me to just take a stab at it? And then you can, you can just yeah. like, you know, that's, that was right. just to save her time. It was right, all born absolutely. out of like that. And then it was like, oh wait, well, you sound like me. And, and, <laughs> and I, I like your voice. And I was doing a lot of like comedic writing at the time also. So she just, yeah, we just connected that way. And that's sort of how it happened. But you're right. Most people would never even allow me into that sit or anyone yeah. into that situation to even get to know whether someone was worthy or not of any oh, of yeah. those things. So then armchair kind of grew out of that, I assume. Yeah. So I've been with them for three years now and really, really what happened is just like a bunch of things simultaneously. All this stuff was happening with <laughs> Kristen and I professionally, but also we were all three of us becoming like very best friends. Hmm. So I also would be working all day and then I would just stay and the three of us (laughs) would hang out and watch a movie or play a game or do something. So Uh now it's just like this, this very bizarre kind of liquid relationship between the three of us where it's like professional and very personal and and we're all friends and it's very unconventional. Um, but it kind of, you know, you have a theme in your life of really enjoying the collaborative yeah. effort with, you know, with all the way going back to friends, this collaborative yes. sort of group of people who are together all the time. And then theater, yeah. of course, rehearsals going into the late hours and then improv. It seems like you really thrive in a situation where both personally and professionally, you know where everybody stands. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and there's such wonderful, giving, generous people across the board and in work. And yeah, so then Dax, um, put me in his movie, put me in chips, which was so Mm -hmm. wonderful. And so, yeah, so basically we've all just been best friends and we've also have this working relationship. And at one point, Re, sort of recently last year, Dax had like mentioned kind of offhand. I mean, he had always like wanted to do a podcast, but I think he thought like, well, I know that he thought like, I mean, there are so many podcasts, like what am I going to do? Like another podcast. And, but yeah, so he had mentioned it kind of offhand and I'm a huge fan of podcasts in general. And so I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's do it. I was like, let's do a podcast then. We're going to do a podcast then. You said you want to, and so we will. Uh So I reached out to my therapist who I found, I don't know if you know the Totally Lame podcast, um, but it's a podcast. When I first moved here, I, I, I just binged every episode of Totally Lame. They started Mm -hmm. another podcast called Totally Married that was just the two of them. And I, oh, oh my God, it got me through so many sad drive is going back and forth from babysitting like jobs I just didn't want to be doing and I have such a fondness for them and that podcast and Elizabeth had on this woman who was a therapist 
And I, at that time, was in very, very much in need of therapy. Sure. So I reached out to Elizabeth's like, you know, hello, a totally lame email, basically. And was right. like, I don't, I don't know if you read this, but how can I get in touch with that woman? She responded. She gave me her info. So then I started seeing that therapist. Okay. okay. So, and then this is like, you know, cut to a couple of years later, we're here and uh-huh. we're doing this podcast. And I was, so then I reached out to my therapist and I was like, can you please set up a personal connection between Elizabeth and I? I'd love to pick her brain about podcasting. She did that. I uh, met with Elizabeth and she was so wonderful and generous. And um, what a neat full circle story. Yes. And like, it gets chill even bumps. more. It gets oh, even more go because on. next week. Dax and I are going on Totally Lame. No way. Yes. And oh my god. Yeah, I've had a lot of kind of weird full circle m- moments in my life, and this is definitely one. And <laughs> I'm so excited to go on. So that's sort of how the podcast happened. And then we we brought on Rob, our other producer, who's very technically proficient and knows what he's doing. And what I love about Rob is that every so often he pipes up and yeah. says says like one thing, and then he's gone. Well, you that's know, what happened it. with me at first. Oh, because, is Because, okay, I was missing for the first three episodes. Like, I just happened, I think I was at auditions or something, and we were okay. far too, it was so early that we were like, no, if a guest can do it at this time, it like has to be that time, and there's just nothing oh, yeah. else we can do about it. Right, absolutely. And so I missed those first three episodes, and so I was not present. And then mm-hmm. I was in the fourth episode, but like, you know, my role, I have a few roles on our podcast, one being produce a producer, but I'm also the co-host. Mm-hmm. However, it's not like a conventional co-hosting situation. We're not speak talking equally, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm basically there to add if I feel like something's missing, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. if if there's a point of view that needs to be piped in or right. something like that being like a female um ethnic yeah. person right. I, sometimes I find that you know it's like I'm there to to pipe in when needed but I'm not there to just like chat the whole time really right so Dax did not introduce me or I I don't think and then it was like people were like who is that <laughs> and I and I said to Dax I said like I I need you to introduce me me I I you know and he and he is very which this is one of the best things about him he's like he just is like not caring what other people think and he's like yeah. no he's like we're gonna do what we do and like they'll huh. get to know you and love you and all these things and I was like okay and then a couple episodes in I was like no 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 I need an introduction because I, we're getting feedback that people are very confused they think like you know this is like some person in another room like listening and just chirp chi- <laughs> like chiming in so when yeah. did you start fact checking like was this yeah. a joke that turned into <laughs> you noticed somebody said something wrong and so you checked it and it became a thing or well, n- no, it wasn't. I'm not like, you know, the resident like fact checker in life or anything. Okay. <laughs> but, but we are both, Dax and I both are very interested in the truth. Mm-hmm. Really diving in and figuring out what's underneath and not taking yeah. things at face value. We're both very much in line with that. And so it was like, oh, and it was just was a thing because he he speaks so definitively about so much that he doesn't know about. And I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's our, that's our premise of our show really is like, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know a lot about a lot of things. Yeah. So he spouts off a lot of statistics and things. And it just became a thing where it was like, well, we should just check just so we're just so we're (laughs) being clear and honest with everyone. So then then that's how the fact checks was was sort of born. And and we really, really enjoy that. We're in this weird social media whatever you want to call it, frenzy of just like quickly outrage. sharing things. Yeah. The age of outrage. Yep. People want sound bites and people want, people want quick expressions so that they can judge an entire person's character. Like they want to take one sentence oh, wow. and decide like this person yep. is a misogynist because they said this. And, yeah. and the truth is just, that's just not how people work. And nobody is, it's nothing is black and white and nobody is just this or just this. And so we're really interested in like exposing all that and just saying like, there's so much, there's so much gray 
Yeah, and, there was oh. actually a conversation you guys had about, I think he said something like if someone was working on the cure for cancer and they had it, but also they were yep. um, anti-Semitic or something. And uh, it was just, it's a very hard question. It is incredibly hard. And, and we don't we don't really claim to have answers necessarily. Sure, you know? no, yeah, right. But it's just a matter of looking deeply at life's questions and not just taking the easy answer as true. I, that's why I think in life, the very best thing you can do is just expose yourself to every kind of person. Not like in a um, patronizing way, but in just like, you know, I forget who it is. Someone had said that our brains can only keep like, 120, I don't know the exact number, but some number, 120 close relationships, oh, like wow. our, our brain can only sustain that amount of, uh, personal relationships. And so the goal is that every one of those 120 people is a different kind of, kind person. of person. It's so easy to judge someone when you have no personal connection to it. Absolutely. But Absolutely. if you know someone who is, you know, that ethnicity or that profession or that thing, immediately whenever you hear a story, you think of your person. That's right. And you think like, wait, but wait, because because my person who I know and love does not do yeah. that and is, yes. you know, it just, it just yes. opens, it, it closes so much um, judgment. And, and there's so much grace that you can give when you have done that work. Yes. And you can just see, you can see humans instead of like ideas. Let's fast forward then to, to now you are, you are actively working in all these really neat things with Dax and Kristen. What about, what about your own world? Is that kind of encompassing your own world right now? Or are you actively pursuing your acting career in other ways as well? Yes, I definitely am still, I still pursue my acting career pretty full force. I just like go on auditions all the time. And um, yeah, so I'm still, I'm still acting a ton and, and still doing all that stuff and definitely still pursuing it. But I think, and what I started to realize commercially last year, I was like, what's happening? Like, why all of a sudden, why am I booking all of these? It doesn't uh -huh. really make sense. And then I started realizing, I was like, oh, I think it's because the rest of my life is very full huh. and happy. And huh. I don't need to book mm. it anymore. Like when I walk mm. in to the room, I'm not like, if I don't book this, I can't eat dinner tonight. Or, or like, right. if I don't book this, like my whole, all of my validation is riding on it. Like none of that really. It's like, I go in and I just like do what I do. Right. And then I leave and then I go do the rest of my day, which is the podcast and writing stuff for Kristen and doing all these things that like, that fill me up just as much. One of the things that you said in some of our earlier conversations was that desperation is a repellent and people can sense it. And I think about even like real job interviews yes. when you go in and um, I, I cringe at all of the interviews I've ever had. I don't have quote a real job anymore, but I would do interviews so differently now. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not going out and buying a new outfit. I'm going to wear yes, probably exactly. what I woke up and put on. And it's so sad because being yourself is what's going to get you the job because mm. people want authenticity and people right. want to know you. And What's interesting about you is is you, not you trying to be what you think they want you to be. Like all of right. it's so mathy in your head. Like you just you just right. can't succeed in that headspace. Right. I think the only place to succeed is like just being like true to yourself. And also, that's, I think that goes across the board. That goes with relationships too. If you're trying yes. to be the person you think they want you to be, it's just not going to work. Like, right. Y even, it might work for a little bit and then no one can keep that up. You know, you mm -mm. just can't. Mm -mm. So you got to just own, own all of your strengths and all of your faults and present that as right. you. In all walks of life, you're right. In relationships, in desk jobs, if you are not being yourself as best as you can be. I mean, we all have hindrances and insecurities, but um, the end result is not going to be something you're even going to enjoy. How how have you evolved from the girl who 
packed up and moved to LA. Um, how have you changed? I have changed mainly in confidence, I think. Mm. It is amazing what confidence does to everything in your life. Right. You know, it changes, it ch- literally changes the way your eyes work. <laughs> like, it, it, you know, like- Is you, that a fact? You, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's a fact. Oh, but I didn't know. I thought, I thought you, I thought you had checked that at some oh, point. And so oh, you knew. oh, 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 <laughs> no, I was no, like, no, oh, no. she knows. She knows. <laughs> Monica, I think you know everything because you're checking yeah, see, all the facts. This is the problem. This is exactly, <laughs> this is. <laughs> That's exactly the problem. <laughs> this is my problem. I'm, I'm being Dax right now and, and making a statement that's definitely false. But I mean, like confidence changes the way you see yourself literally when you look in the mirror I can like right. you, you know and we the way you s- see other people and it's like man we we project so much um based on the what, what we're thinking and the based on the way we feel about ourselves and our mental state and all of these things but anyway point is um I I do think that I've I've gotten so much more confident and comfortable with myself and my story and who I am I do think working with Kristen and Dax really had a profound effect. And I think sure. they're, they're much to attribute to. They just really believe in me hmm. and have given me so many opportunities because they believe I can. Mm-hmm. And it has been so empowering to have worked hmm and work so closely with them and feel like these people think I can do it and I can. When they are grounded in the fact that they understand that all of this around them uh, is kind of just massive luck. And so as much as they can be kind to those people around them that, that have been put in their life that need opportunity as much as they needed opportunity, it's, it's a thing that you have to be so confident to be able to do. And I admire people who have enough self-confidence to that aren't intimidated by other people. Yeah. That are only, you know, their own, their, their purpose is to just build people up. And it is so, you're right. It is much easier said than done to do that because people feel threatened really easily and, and they just really, really don't. And Kristen is like, all she does is give, 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 Mm. give. I mean, Mm -hmm. it is such a massive part of her life and she sees a lot of return. Yeah. And I don't think it's a coincidence. And I I feel really lucky like to, to just be around it and sort of garner some of those things and try to take them for myself. Yeah. And may we learn to do that to younger generations as well to continue that on. Yeah. Because it's so important. Very. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Monica Padman. While you're here in your podcast app, go ahead and search for Armchair Expert and give that a subscribe. They are actually going on a live tour later this year, perhaps to a city near you. So be looking out for that. Also, while you're in the subscribing mood, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to the Rogue Ones podcast if you haven't already. This is your first time with us. Welcome. I'm so glad you've joined us. I like to sit down with extraordinary people doing fascinating things so we can learn from them. And I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you to Monica Patman. And as always, thank you to Ryan Swinehart of Sick Island Studios here in Nashville, Tennessee, for making this podcast sound absolutely splendid. Have a good day wherever it is that you are, and we'll see you next time. Take care.